2022 was also a record year for fair market value or FMV deals. There have been 95 FMB deals since 2015, surpassing over $1.4 billion in announced value. I am Reese Tisdale, and this is Future Water, which we talk about all the ways which companies, utilities, and people are addressing the challenges and opportunities in water. This is episode 66, and it's going to be a good one. I'm joined today by Bluefield analyst Charlie Seuss to talk about investor-owned utilities, water utilities, that is, M&A, competitive trends, and really the notable impacts on the sector that have taken place over the past year. Our team has just wrapped up an analysis of 2022. We've gone through all the dockets. We've looked at policy changes. We'll bring Charlie in to talk about that. But before we jump into things, I wanted to sound off an alarm bell of sorts, but there's a... uh, reason for this. Globally, 785 million people do not have access to clean water. And as such, women and girls are more often burdened by the task of walking to and carrying water back home to provide for their families and communities. The average round trip to a water source is 2.4 miles or takes about five hours a day to carry five gallons. I've seen it. I've lived it. You can reach out to me and ask me about my experiences. For this reason, among others, Bluefield Research is partnering with WaterAid in a ramp up to World Water Day on 22nd of March, 2023. Since 1981, WaterAid has worked in 34 countries in which it has reached 28.5 million people. To learn more about WaterAid and make a contribution to be part of the solution, visit wateraid.org. So now on to our regularly scheduled recording or discussion with Charlie Seuss. All right, I'm joined here by Charlie Seuss, analyst with Bluefield Research. Charlie, how are things? Good. Yeah, um, just got a bunch of snow here this morning in Boston, so waiting for to see that light at the end of the tunnel for spring, but doing pretty good. The fact that you have made it into the office is impressive. We'll see if others, it's early on a uh, Thursday morning here, so we'll see what uh, the rest of the crowd looks like today. Uh, Although it is someone's birthday for what that's worth. Hopefully they will come in to celebrate. Charlie, before we uh, jump into a discussion on investor and utilities and trends and opportunities and what we've seen over the past year, why don't you give the listeners a little bit of an idea about what you've been up to since joining Bluefield this past fall? Yeah. So in the private water space, we just wrapped up our Q4 analysis of different M&A activity in the IOU space in the US, looking at different company strategies for the past year and, and you know what they've been up to in recent years, as well as some policy analysis that's impacting M&A strategies. And then outside of the US, started looking into what water companies are up to in Mexico and beyond in Latin America. Um, at least in Mexico, there's been a lot of really interesting policy changes and investments in in recent years um, since the 2019 infrastructure investment plan. And so taking some deep dives into the market ins and outs, including the role for for private investment and public-private partnerships, as well as some competitive analysis. So that's been really interesting and excited to keep digging into that. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. But, you know, the the Mexico piece in particular, because it sort of leverages what we've looked at in the past. But like you said, there's been changes happening and there are a number of global players looking around the world in places like Mexico, but also Latin America as a whole. Like I said, that's fantastic. And so let's leverage actually the U.S. private water analysis you've done. And let's talk a little bit about that, about investor and utilities. Um, and a big reason for this is, I think last week even, I think it hit the press or hit our website is a better way to put it. We released our year-end analysis of utility acquisitions and market changes of what we've seen. So why don't you give us a sense of some of the key trends you saw over the past year? Yeah, yeah. It was definitely an interesting year for utility acquisitions. M&A activity stabilized last year. There were about 150 deals approved, which was well short of the you know the pace of deals in, in 2021, which was 219 which is the the highest year on record that we, you know since Bluefield has been tracking M and A activity in the IOU space. Texas is continues to be one of the hotspots, or really the hotspot for IOU acquisitions. And it was heavily concentrated in the state in 2022. There were 47 deals there with 24 different buyers, which you know just goes to show how competitive that market is. 
2022 was also a record year for fair market value or FMV deals. IRU is really starting to streamline that regulatory process in the states where the legislation is active. There have been 95 FMV deals since 2015, you know, surpassing over $1.4 billion in announced value. And, and that encompasses over 253,000 customer connections. So it's it's a, a sizable impact. And then lastly, you know, uh, another state that where competition has been ramping up is, is Arizona. Um, some of the major players there, like NW Natural, Global Water Resources, EPCOR, and, and Arizona Water Company are, um, you know, really looking to leverage economies of scale in, in, in a water stress state to, uh, you know, acquire what was last year, 46,000 connections. So um, definitely, you know, an interesting state to watch looking forward. So do we have a sense for why 2022 declined from 2021, at least as, as total number of deals? Well, for one, um, Central States, which is a, a private equity-backed firm, made up 90 of those 200-plus deals in 2021. So, And most of those were you know, very small systems, um, definitely. But even in 2022, there are 150 approved deals were pretty on pace with the five-year average. So not quite a slow year, but pretty comparable in terms of you know recent year activity. And as far as like, you know, that's deal flow. And one of the big questions that always comes up is, you know, not just number of transactions, but also number of connections. Can you give us a sense of what that looked like for 2022? Yeah, the approved deals in 2022 accounted for a combined total of you know, over 193,000 customer connections changing hands, um, which is, you know, a, a 65% decrease from the previous year. But again, those high numbers in 2021 were largely driven up by Liberty Utilities takeover of American Water in New York, as well as Veolia's acquisition of Suez, which, you know, those two deals together accounted for 76% of the connections added. So looking to 2023, I think the merger of Corex and Southwest will transfer, you know, roughly 300,000 connections once approved. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that stacks up as well. So when it comes to connections, it seems like from year to year, it can be lumpy, a couple big moves. I mean, I remember a couple of years ago when Eversource acquired Aquarian, it kind of shifted the trend line a bit made it a bit lumpier so well you mentioned texas you know what are the what are the most active states is it pretty concentrated a couple among a couple states what what sort of uh, geographic diversity are we seeing yeah so i mean there were you know we, we tracked deal flow in 27 states last year with obviously the highest number of deals occurring in texas but uh louisiana Missouri and, and Pennsylvania had, I, I think, 16, 12, and, you know, another dozen, um, respectively. So um, those were some pretty active states after Texas. But if you look at Mississippi and Arizona, two states where m and activity really spiked in 2021, deal flow was down there. But I, I do think those are, you know, two states to watch, um, given what's in the pipeline for the upcoming year. And I think I know the answer. You alluded to it a little while ago. What about the buyers? Who, who's who's most active among the companies? It's definitely dominated by you know central states and American Water in, in the last couple of years, especially over forty one percent of the systems acquired last year alone um, were initiated by those two companies. Yeah, I mean, I think that's expected. Like we said, and those are they actually have two different approaches. I mean, American Water is the you know, if you want to call them the 800 pound gorilla in the market landscape and central states really over the past three to five years really come on strong buying, definitely buying small systems, but also at high volumes and also increasing its uh, geographic footprint. It's really active across a number of states. So they are definitely one worth watching and have now have a legitimate platform from which to build. But I don't want to put the cart ahead of the horse, but I know you've been doing some research on fair market value. And we talked a little bit about this, I believe, in December with Isabel Kesman on this podcast. Um, just my basic question, because this came up the other day in a conversation we had in regards to the research you're doing. Are fair market value policies driving more deals? Like of the deals that we've seen, is the volume up because of that? Or can you? 
give us some uh, perspective on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, in, in 2022, FMV deals accounted for about 18% of the, the total deal flow, while the five-year average is around 10%. But that hasn't necessarily coincided with an increase in the total number of deals for every state. What is clear from the data is that FMB is undoubtedly changing, you know, the characteristics and the nature of these deals. Um, and so, first of all, the the size of deals seems to be increasing. Medium and large systems uh, comprise just twelve percent of non FMB deal flow, but account for almost half of all FMB acquisitions. By comparison, fifty percent of FMB deals involve smaller, very small systems, um, which make up you know, 77% of non-FMB deals. So the size of, of, of deals is, is certainly a factor there. Second, we're, we're definitely seeing an increase in public sellers. About 65% of FMB deals are privatizations, you know, private buyer with a, you know, municipal or public seller. Um, and then lastly, in 2022, the average cost per connection for FMB deals was about twice as much as non-FMB deals. And so we're definitely seeing higher purchase prices for these deals. Um, and uh, that's a trend that, you know, continues to go up. Yeah, I think this is really interesting. And, you know, as we talked before recording this, you know, I was going through the deck that you had put together on fair market value. So it's really interesting to see what is happening and how it's rolling out across what are now 12 states. It takes a little bit of time seemingly for it to ramp up. But uh, I think your points are good ones. One, the I think that given the state of the world, state of the economy, the pressure on municipalities and to manage their water systems is getting increasingly complicated. So in some cases, this may be an outlet um, for them to capture value. But we'll talk about that in the deck. But one question, you know, changing gears a little bit, you know, obviously it's in the news every day and that's what's happening in the Western U.S., the Colorado River. It seems to be a disaster in, you know, a lot of different ways. But you just, I don't think it's released yet, but it's about to be some analysis on Arizona, what's happening there with the community, but also EPCOR. EPCOR, a Canadian investor in utility has gotten involved. Can you give us a quick highlight of what that analysis is about and sort of what sort of sparked it? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's been a really interesting, um, you know, story to follow. Um, it's obviously an, an, an unfortunate development, but uh, the Rio Verde foothills, which is an unincorporated community of about 500 households in, in Northern Maricopa County, Arizona, was recently cut off from its primary water source, which was commercially hauled water from the nearby city of Scottsdale. That decision came, uh, you know, amid ongoing supply shortages in the Colorado River Basin, um, which triggered Scottsdale's codified drought management plan, uh, which banned water hauling beyond the city limits. So with really no other options, the Arizona Corporation Commission tapped EPCOR to provide an alternative supply Given that the company has such a broad footprint in the in the state, I think they have about over you know two hundred thirty thousand connections in in Arizona alone, which is at least half of the privately owned you know major IOU connections there. So in a nutshell, you know, given the state of Arizona's water supply cuts, opportunities for investor-owned utilities like Epcor, you know, I think will definitely increase as communities are look for more efficient and, and more reliable water supplies um, in, in such a water stress state. Yeah, I think this is this Rio Verde foothills um, conundrum is amazing in the sense that this is a community that was developed and it's not uncommon in Arizona. It seems that the communities are developed and then water is hauled in you know, much like in the Northeast, oil is brought to people's homes so they can heat their homes. In this case, water is driven around in a truck or hauled in a truck and offloaded into tanks within these households. So now, given what's happened with the Colorado River Basin, the lower states in particular, Arizona is taking some pretty steep cuts. Now we're moving into, or if not already in, you know, tier two of cuts. So Scottsdale, this has been a train that's been rolling down the tracks for a while. So it's not like on January 1st, 
Scottsdale woke up one morning and said, hey, we're cutting this community off. The, the writing has been on the wall. And I think to your point that EPCOR and the ACC, Arizona Corporation Commission, they've been at this actually before even the cutoff even happened. So I guess if there's, are there any takeaways from this as a whole? Yeah. So Arizona has 750 or so community water systems, of which about 59% are very small systems serving less than 500 people. So those systems are increasingly being exposed to the, the rapidly changing water supply situation in the state and the Southwest more broadly. But Arizona and the Colorado River dependent states are, you know, they, they might be opportunities for in, investor-owned utilities to consolidate and streamline and, and build out more efficient water infrastructure, um, you know, from reuse to desalination and brackish water and, and, and other operations. So there's a lot of potential there. And, and then for what it's worth, Arizona has been the fourth most active state for IOUs with the EPCOR, NW Natural, Global Water Resources, and Arizona Water Company all, you know, acquiring, you know, systems in recent years that many of which indicate a, you know, water management strategy that, that goes beyond, you know, just a community. So it's been really interesting to watch that unfold and look forward to uh, kind of tracking that in the future. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. I mean, if for those who haven't seen sort of the declining levels of Lake Mead, which I guess is the canary in the coal mine, because there are 40 million people or so that are relying on the Colorado River, it'll be interesting to see what happens particularly when it comes to utility water management. We've talked about things like total water management. We've talked about reuse. We've talked about desal, whether it be seawater or brackish. There are lots of strategies and angles to be taken. And IOUs, I think, see themselves as playing a role in this. Um, one, they are have access to capital. Two, they have technical uh, expertise. Um, they have... Um, resources to help manage it. Not always the solution, but among a portfolio of solutions, particularly for these small systems. I mean, the small community water systems, it's not just Arizona, but across the US. Those are the ones that are most stressed. And they've typically been the target for the investor owns, right? I think it's when you look at M&A, I think 65 to 70%, give or take a couple points, have really been for small systems across the US. So well, Charlie, we covered a lot of ground. Let's uh, leave the good stuff for those with access to the research. I know there's a lot more, whether it be in this EPCOR Arizona research note that's about to come out, the fair market value market insight report, which, like I said, I looked at this morning and is fantastic. And then lastly, we've already released a, what we call a quarterly, but it's really an annual compendium of what's happened over the past year for the... Uh, private water landscape in the u.s thanks for the time and thoughts and you know and braving the horrific weather yeah absolutely no this is always fun so thanks all right charlie take it easy we'll uh talk soon all right there you have it that's uh some good stuff from charlie seuss bluefield analyst uh before we sign off if you're in boston let us know we can set up a meeting at our downtown office location even in bad weather we'll be here Please subscribe to the Future Water Podcast and give us a review. It helps us help you send us a note to water experts at bluefieldresearch.com with any topic ideas you would like us to discuss. We are doing this for you and tell a friend about it. That's how we expand our audience. This podcast and these water industry insights have been brought to you by the one and only Bluefield Research. To learn more about us, visit us at bluefieldresearch.com until we talk again. You all be safe and take care.